farm tomorrow, and I will speak to Anne Catherick myself. The first thing I had to do the next morning was to ask Mr. Fairley if I could leave my job a month early. As his nerves were particularly bad, I could not speak to him directly, but had to write a note, explaining that some unexpected news forced me to return to London. In reply, I received a most unpleasant letter, informing me that I could go. Once, such a letter would have upset me greatly. Now I no longer cared. Later, Miss Halcombe and I walked to the farm, and Miss Halcombe went in while I waited nearby. To my surprise, she returned after only a few minutes. Does Anne Catherick refuse to see you? I asked. Anne Catherick? has gone, replied Miss Halcombe. She left this morning, with Mrs. Clements. The farmer's wife, Mrs. Todd, has no idea why they left or where they went. She just said that Anne Catherick had been disturbed after reading something in the local newspaper a couple of days ago. I looked at the paper and saw that it mentioned Laura's future wedding. Then Mrs. Todd said that Anne Catherick fainted last night, apparently in shock at something mentioned by one of the servant girls from our house, who was visiting the farm on her evening off. We hurried back to the house to question the servant girl. Miss Halcombe asked her if she had mentioned Sir Percival Glyde's name while at the farm. Oh, yes, the girl replied. I said he was coming on Monday. At that moment a cab arrived, and Mr. Gilmore, the family friend and legal adviser got out. He was an elderly man, pleasant-looking and neatly dressed. Miss Halcombe introduced me, and then went away to discuss family matters with him. I wandered out into the garden. My time at Limeridge House was nearly at an end, and I wanted to say a last goodbye to the places where I had so often walked with Miss Fairley in the dream time of my happiness and my love. But the autumn day was grey and damp, and those golden memories were already fading. As I returned to the house, I met Mr. Gilmore. Ah, Mr. Hartwright, he said. Miss Halcombe has told me how helpful you have been about this strange letter received by Miss Fairley. I want you to know that the investigation is now in my safe hands. I have written to Sir Percival Glyde's lawyer in London, and I'm sure we will receive a satisfactory explanation. I'm afraid I am not so sure as you, was my reply. Well, well, said Mr. Gilmore, we will wait for events. At dinner that evening, my last dinner at Limeridge House, it was a hard battle to keep my self-control. I saw that it was not easy for Miss Fairley either. She gave me her hand as she had done in happier days, but her fingers trembled and her face was pale. Mr. Gilmore kept the conversation going, and afterwards we went into the sitting room as usual. Miss Fairley sat at the piano. Shall I play some of those pieces by Mozart that you like? Will you sit in your old chair, near me? she asked nervously. As it is my last night, I will, I answered. I am very sorry you are going, she said, almost in a whisper. I shall remember those kind words, Miss Fairley. Long after tomorrow has gone, I replied. Don't speak about tomorrow. Then she played, and at last it was time to say good night. The next morning I found Miss Halcombe and Miss Fairley waiting for me downstairs. When I began to speak, Miss Fairley turned and hurried from the room. I tried to control my voice, but could only say, Will you write to me, Miss Halcombe? She took both my hands in hers, and her face grew beautiful with the force of her generosity and pity. Of course I will, Walter. Goodbye, and God bless you. She left and a few seconds later Miss Fairley returned, holding something. 
It was her own sketch of the summer house where we had first met. With tears in her eyes, she offered it to me. To remind you, she whispered. My own tears fell as I kissed her hand. Then I turned to go. She sank into a chair. Her head dropped on her arms. At that moment, I knew that Laura Fairley loved me, too. But it was over. We were separated. Part Two The Story Told by Marion Halcombe Chapter Four Arrangements for a Marriage It was a sad day when Walter Hartwright left us. Laura stayed in her room all day, and I felt sad and depressed. Poor Mr. Gilmore must have had a dull time. And the next morning, when Laura reappeared looking pale and ill, I thought he seemed rather anxious about her. I was anxious too. Laura is such a sensitive and loving person that it was no surprise to me to find that she had grown fond of Walter. Indeed, I have grown fond of him myself. But I honestly believe that time will cure Laura of these feelings. Two days after Walter left, Sir Percival Glyde arrived. He is forty-five years old, but seems younger. He is handsome and only a little bold, has perfect manners, and is pleasant, agreeable, and respectful. I really must try to like him. In the afternoon, while Laura was out of the room, Sir Percival referred to Anne Catherick's letter. I read Mr. Gilmore's letter to my lawyer, he said, and I want to give you a full explanation. Mrs. Catherick, you see, worked for me and my family for many years. Her marriage was unfortunate in that her husband deserted her and her only child, a girl, became mentally ill and needed to be put in an asylum. So, in recognition of Mrs. Catherick's services, I agreed to pay the expenses of a private asylum for the girl. Unfortunately, the girl discovered this and consequently developed a hatred for me. She recently escaped from the asylum, and I'm sure she wrote this letter because of her hatred for me. It's all very sad. Mr. Gilmore found this explanation perfectly satisfactory and said so. He then looked at me for agreement, but I was struggling with a sense of unease that I could not explain and hesitated before answering. Sir Percival noticed this at once. May I beg you, Miss Halcombe, he said politely, to write to Mrs. Catherick to ask if these facts are true. I did not want to agree to this, but how could I refuse without making the situation even more embarrassing than it already was? So I went to the desk, wrote a note, and gave it to him. Without looking at it, he put it in an envelope and wrote the address. Now that is done, he said. May I ask if Anne Catherick spoke to Miss Fairley or to you? No. She spoke to nobody except Mr. Hartwright, I replied. Ah, yes, the drawing teacher, he said thoughtfully. And did you discover where Anne Catherick was staying? I described the farm to him. It is my duty to try to find her, he continued. Tomorrow I will go to this farm and make inquiries. Soon afterwards, he left to go up to his room. That evening and the next day, Sir Percival took every opportunity to bring Laura into the conversation, but she hardly took any notice. He went to the farm to make his inquiries about Anne Catherick, but learnt nothing. Then, on Wednesday, a letter came from Mrs. Catherick, a short, business-like letter, 
thanking me for my note and saying that everything Sir Percival had told me was completely correct. Why did I still have doubts? This surely was enough proof for anyone. But how I wished that Walter Hartwright had been there to give his opinion. At Sir Percival's request, I now had to give Laura his explanation of Anne Catherick's letter. She listened quietly and showed no emotion, but I noticed that on the table near her hand was the little book of Hartwright's drawings. I also had to tell her that the reason for Sir Percival's visit was to fix the day of their marriage. I'm afraid he will ask you to decide quite soon, Laura. Oh, no, Marion, I can't do that, she said. Please ask him, beg him to allow me more time. I promise to give him a final answer before the end of the year, but not yet. Please, not yet. Sir Percival agreed to this request, and when Mr. Gilmore heard about it, he arranged to have a private talk with Laura. I have to return to London tomorrow, he said to me, and I need to discuss the financial side of this marriage with Miss Fairley before I go. As you know, she will inherit a great deal of money and property when she becomes twenty-one next March, and I must include all this in the marriage agreement in a way that reflects Miss Fairley's own wishes and is also acceptable to Sir Percival. He had the meeting with Laura the next morning, and in the afternoon he left for London, looking rather sad and thoughtful. Wondering what had been said, I hurried up to Laura's room. Oh, Marion, come in, she said. I need to talk to you. What is it, Laura? Is it about the marriage agreement? No, I couldn't even bear to discuss that with Mr. Gilmore. I'm ashamed to say that all I could do was cry. He was very kind and good, Marion, and he said that he would look after everything for me. No, what I wanted to tell you was this. I cannot bear the situation any longer. I must end it. Her eyes were bright, and she spoke with great energy. I began to feel alarmed. What do you wish to do, Laura, darling? Do you want to be released from your promise to marry Sir Percival? No, she said simply. I cannot break my promise to my father, but I want to tell the truth, and I will confess to Sir Percival that I love someone else. Laura, he has no right to know that, I said in amazement. I cannot deceive him, she said. I have thought it over carefully. After I have told him, let him do as he wishes. I looked into her innocent, loving eyes and could say nothing. I just put my arms around her, trying not to cry myself. May I speak to him tomorrow, in your presence, Marion? I held her tight and agreed, though I was not sure I was doing the right thing. Indeed, I was not sure of anything. I could not understand how I had failed to see how deeply she loved Walter Hartwright. For the first time in my life, I had made a mistake about her, now I realised that she would love him all her life. The first thing that happened the next morning did nothing to make me feel more cheerful. A letter arrived for me from poor Walter Hartwright. He had decided to leave England and asked me if I could help him find employment abroad. I was then alarmed to read that since his return to London, he had neither seen nor heard anything of Anne Catherick, but suspected he had been watched and followed by strange men. I was worried about his state of mind, so I immediately wrote to some friends in London to ask if they could help him find a suitable job 
in another country. Laura, of course, knew nothing about these letters. Sir Percival did not join us for breakfast, but sent a message saying he would meet us at eleven o'clock as arranged. Laura seemed calm and unusually self-controlled. I had never seen her like this. It was almost as if love had created a new force in her character. At exactly eleven, Sir Percival knocked and entered, with anxiety and worry in every line of his face. This meeting would decide his future life, and he obviously knew it. You may wonder, Sir Percival, said Laura calmly, if I am going to ask to be released from my promise to marry you. I am not going to ask this. I respect my father's wishes too much. His face relaxed a little, but I saw one of his feet nervously beating the carpet. No, if we are going to withdraw from our planned marriage, it will be because of your wish, Sir Percival, not mine. Mine? he said in great surprise. What reason could I have for withdrawing? A reason that is very hard to tell you, she answered. There is a change in me. His face went so pale that even his lips lost their colour. He turned his head to one side. What change? he asked, trying to hide his nervousness. When the promise was made two years ago, she said, my love did not belong to anyone. Will you forgive me, Sir Percival, if I tell you that it now belongs to another person? Her tears started to fall, and Sir Percival hid his face behind his hand, so that it was impossible to know what he was thinking. He made no answer, and my temper got the better of me. Sir Percival, I said sharply, have you nothing to say? You have already heard more than you have a right to hear. But I didn't ask for that right, he said avoiding my question. I wish you to understand, Laura continued, that I will never see this person again, and that if you leave me, you only allow me to remain a single woman for the rest of my life. All I ask is that you forgive me and keep my secret. I will do both those things, he said. Then he looked at Laura, as if he was waiting to hear more. I think I have said enough to give you reason to withdraw from our marriage, she added quietly. No, you have said enough to make it the dearest wish of my life to marry you, he said, getting up and advancing towards her. Laura gave a cry of surprise but I had more than half expected this. Every word she had spoken had shown her honesty and her innocence, but these fine qualities had destroyed her own hopes of a release. Sir Percival understood very well the priceless value of a pure and true woman. Why would he give her up now? I will do everything I can to earn your love he said, and perhaps in time I will win it. Never, she answered, looking more beautiful than ever. I will be your true and loyal wife, but never your loving wife. That is enough for me. I accept your loyalty and your truth, he said, then raised her hand to his lips and silently left the room. Laura sat without moving. I put my arm around her. At last, she said, I must resign myself, Marion. If you write to Walter, don't tell him how unhappy I am. And if I die first, please say to him, 
say what I could never say myself. Say I loved him. Then she threw herself on the sofa and cried as if her heart was breaking, until at last she fell asleep. In the days that followed, it seemed that nothing could prevent this miserable marriage from taking place. I tried to make Laura change her mind, but she was determined to keep her promise and to do her duty. Mr. Fairley was, of course, very happy that the family worry was now at an end and suggested that the sooner his niece got married, the better. This made me very angry, but when I told Laura, I was surprised by her calm reply. My uncle is right. I have caused trouble and anxiety to everyone. Let Sir Percival decide on the day for our marriage. Sir Percival was delighted by this news, and he then left to prepare for the bride's reception at his house in Hampshire. I thought that a change would do Laura good, so I arranged for us both to go and stay with some friends in Yorkshire. She passively agreed with my idea. I also wrote to Mr. Gilmore, telling him this marriage would now take place. The next day, I received a letter from Walter Hartwright, saying that my friends had got him a job on an expedition to Central America. He was going to be the artist for the expedition. He was leaving on the 21st of November and would be away for six months. I could only hope that this was for the best. Laura and I then departed for Yorkshire, but after only nine days there, we received a letter from Mr. Fairley, calling us back to Limeridge immediately. What could this mean, I wondered. I found out as soon as we arrived. Mr. Fairley and Sir Percival had agreed on the 22nd of December for the wedding, provided that Laura also agreed. Would I please persuade her, said Mr. Fairley. His nerves were much too bad to talk to her himself. I also found our old friend Mr. Gilmore, who had come to talk to Mr. Fairley about the marriage agreement. He was leaving that day, and was anxious to speak to me alone before he left. I am not at all happy about the financial arrangements in the agreement, Miss Halcombe, he said, but there is nothing I can do about it. I know how fond you are of your sister, and I think you ought to know why I am concerned. As you will know, he went on, there are three parts to Miss Fairley's inheritance. Firstly, on Mr. Fairley's death, she will inherit the Limeridge property and land, and the income from it. If she dies childless, this property will go to a cousin, but the income from it will go to her husband during his lifetime. If she has a son, everything... A property and income will go to the son. No problems there. Secondly, when Miss Fairley reaches the age of 21 next March, she will receive the income from £10,000. This £10,000 will go to her Aunt Eleanor if Miss Fairley dies before her aunt, which is not very likely. The reason Miss Fairley's father did not leave the £10,000 to his sister Eleanor on his death was that he disapproved strongly of her marriage to a foreigner, even though the man was an Italian nobleman, Count Fosco. Yes, Laura has told me about that, I said. Well, Mr. Gilmore went on, there are no problems there either. But the third part of Miss Fairley's inheritance is more difficult. Next March, she will also inherit £20,000, which will be her own money completely. If she dies before her husband, 
the income from the twenty thousand pounds will go to Sir Percival for his lifetime, and the capital will go to their children. If there are no children to inherit the capital, Miss Fairley can choose relations and friends to inherit the money when she dies. That's what I proposed, but Sir Percival's lawyer did not accept it. He insists that if Sir Percival survives his wife and there are no children, Sir Percival should receive the capital. In that case. Nothing will go to any other member of the family, including you, Miss Halcom. Mister Gilmore sighed deeply. I protested strongly. I tried every argument I could, but nothing would change the lawyer's mind. I've discovered, you see, that Sir Percival is always in debt and always in need of cash. My last effort has been to come here to try and persuade Mister Fairley to oppose this demand from Sir Percival's lawyer. I am sorry to say, I have not succeeded. Mister Fairley wishes to avoid all responsibility for his niece's marriage arrangements. He says that his niece will not die before Sir Percival anyway. So what is there to worry about? Mr. Gilmore stood up to go and picked up his hat. I shall complete the agreement and send it in. I have no choice. If I don't do it, Mr. Fairley will find another lawyer who will. But I tell you, Miss Halcom, no daughter of mine should be married to any man alive under such an agreement as I am forced to make for Miss Fairley. With that. He shook my hand, and without another word, he went away to catch his train back to London. After he had gone, I tried to be sensible. Mister Fairley was Laura's guardian, and if he chose to accept this agreement, there was nothing I could do about it. It was just one more worry about this dreadful marriage. A more immediate worry was the date of the wedding. When I told Laura, she turned pale and trembled. Not so soon, she cried. Oh, Marian, not so soon. Well, let me speak to Mister Fairley then, I said, ready to fight for her. I will try to change it. No, she said faintly. Too late, Marian. Too late. It will only make more trouble. Please tell my uncle I agree. I think I would have cried if I had not been so angry. I rushed into Mister Fairley's room and shouted loudly, "Laura agrees to the twenty-second," and rushed out again, banging the door noisily. I hoped I had destroyed his nerves for the whole day. After this. The wedding preparations began. The dressmakers came and went all the time. There was packing and planning, and all kinds of arrangements to make. We heard every day from Sir Percival. After the wedding, he proposed to take Laura to Italy for six months. They would meet a number of Sir Percival's friends there, including his best and oldest friend, Count Fosco. Whose wife, of course, was Laura's aunt Eleanor. At least this marriage would bring Laura and her aunt together again. I thought. The count himself sounded a most interesting person, and I rather hoped that I would meet him one day. All too quickly, the days passed. Sir Percival arrived, looking a little tired and anxious, but talking and laughing like the happiest of men. The evening after he arrived, he went off to the village to ask if anyone had any news of Anne Catherick. No one had heard anything, but I had to admit that it was good of him to continue to try to help her. I have decided to try and think better of him. After all, what reason do I have to distrust him?
I am sure that I could like him if I really tried. It is getting quite easy to like him. Today I spoke to him about the dearest wish of both Laura and myself, that I should be able to live with Laura after her marriage, just as I had always lived with her before. He agreed instantly, and seemed delighted with the plan. I would be the ideal, the perfect companion for his wife, he said. Yes, I am beginning to like Sir Percival very much. I hate Sir Percival. He has no sensitivity, no kindness, no good feeling. Last night, he whispered something in Laura's ear. She has refused to tell me what it was, and her face turned white with misery. He took no notice at all, and all my suspicions of him have returned. Is he now showing his true character? He seems more restless and nervous than before, and is often sharp and bad-tempered. I have this strange idea that something might happen to prevent the marriage, and that he is afraid of that. A foolish thought. I must forget it. As the day of our separation grows nearer, Laura cannot bear to have me out of her sight. I must be brave and cheerful for her sake, but my fear will not go away. Will this marriage be the one terrible mistake of her life, and the one hopeless sorrow of mine? It is the twenty-second. No more time for tears. Laura is dressed, and we leave for the church. By eleven o'clock, they are married. By three o'clock, they are gone. I am blind with crying, and can write no more. Chapter 5 A Document for Signature 6 long lonely months passed and I had little to do but think of absent friends I received a cheerful letter from Walter Hartwright after he arrived in Honduras and just before he set off with the expedition into the forest since then I have heard nothing there was no news of Anne Catherick or Mrs Clements poor Mr Gilmore fell very ill and had to give up work, but his business is continued by his partner, Mr. Kirill. Mrs. Vesey has moved to London to live with her sister, and Mr. Fairley, I believe, is secretly delighted to have his house free of women. Most of all, of course, I thought about Laura. Many letters came from her, but she said very little in them. She told me she was well, but hardly mentioned her husband, and wrote not a word about Count Fosco, whom they had met in Austria, not Italy. I understood from her silence that she did not like him. All she said was that her aunt Eleanor, Madame Fosco, was quieter and more sensible than she had used to be. On the 11th of June, I arrived at Blackwater Park, Sir Percival's family home in Hampshire. The waiting was nearly over, and how happy I was! The next day, Laura and her husband would return home, together with Count Fosco and his wife, who were going to spend the summer at Blackwater. In the morning, the housekeeper, Mrs. Mitchelson, showed me round the house. It is very old, and much of it is dusty and unused. Only one part of the enormous building is comfortable enough to live in. Later, I explored the gardens and the park. The gardens are small and not well kept, and there are so many trees that the house feels shut in by them. I found a path through the trees, which after half a mile brought me to a lake. It was a damp, lonely place. The still, dark waters of the lake and the long shadows from the tall trees gave it a gloomy air. Near the lake there was an old boathouse with some seats in it, so I went in and sat down for a rest. I am not a nervous person generally, 
But when I heard the sound of quick breathing under my seat, I jumped to my feet in alarm. In fact, it was a dog, a small black and white dog, with a bullet wound in its side. I carried the poor creature back to the house and sent for Mrs. Mitchelson to help me. When she came in and saw the dog lying on the floor, she cried out at once, Oh, that must be Mrs. Catherick's dog. Whose? I asked, amazed. Mrs. Catherick's. Do you know her? She came here to ask for news of her daughter. When? Yesterday. She'd heard that her daughter Anne had been seen in the neighbourhood, but no one knew anything. I suppose the dog ran away into the woods and got shot by the park keeper. I tried to make my voice sound politely interested. I suppose you've known Mrs. Catherick for some years? Oh, no, Miss Halcombe. I never saw her before. She lives at Wilmingham, twenty-five miles away. I had heard of her because of Sir Percival paying for her daughter to go to an asylum. But yesterday, Mrs. Catherick asked me not to mention her visit to Sir Percival. That was an odd thing to say, wasn't it, Miss? Odd indeed. But then we had to turn our attention to the poor dog, which, despite our efforts, died a little while later. It was a sad thing to happen on my first day at Blackwater. Later that evening, the travellers returned. After my first happiness at meeting Laura, I felt there was a strangeness between us, and I realised she had changed. I was sure we would soon get back to normal, but she had lost her innocent openness. She was unwilling to talk about her married life, and I saw that there were no warm feelings between her husband and her. It wasn't long before she asked me about Walter. Have you heard from him? Is he well and happy? And it was clear to me that she loved him as deeply as ever. As for Sir Percival, his manners are sharper and less pleasant. On meeting me, he simply said, Hello, Miss Halcombe, glad to see you again, and then walked past me. Little things seemed to annoy him a great deal. For example, the housekeeper told him a man had called to speak to him a week ago, but had left no name. Sir Percival demanded a description of the man, which poor Mrs. Mitchelson was unable to give, and Sir Percival stormed out of the room in great anger. Laura was certainly right about Madame Fosco. Never have I seen such a change in a woman. As Eleanor Fairley, aged thirty-seven, she wore bright clothes, was silly and foolish, and always talked nonsense. As Madame Fosco, aged forty-three, she wears only grey or black, and sits for hours in silence, doing needlework, rolling up cigarettes with the Count, or just looking at him with the eyes of a loyal dog. And the man who has achieved this extraordinary change? The man who has tamed this wild Englishwoman? Yes, what can I say about the Count? He looks like a man who could tame anything. If 